and so we have to be aware of how our presuppositions are tainting the facts and we have to make sure that we limit them to a certain extent but there is a, a value and central and important debate as to say to ask the question whose presuppositions are more consistent with the historical task this is a big debate that is not debated on campuses amongst atheists and Christians it is a big debate that is not properly been done in the academic world and needs to be done much more most academics will spend some time on their presuppositions but the vast majority of academics do not do enough reflection on their presuppositions and if they did they would actually adopt different methodology different presupposition if they realized how inconsistent the presuppositions are especially in the nature I could go on more and expand on that much more but I'll leave it there for discussion and debate for anybody who wants to engage with me on that please feel free to make comments if you make stupid comments you'll be blocked but I will leave this comment section open for anybody who wants to engage in the debate about presuppositions and the historical task so we have to consider presuppositions and then secondly we have to think about methodology our methodology of how we engage in um, the historical task is important uh, the criteria that we use the way we tackle the information is important often and I've listened to many many debates on the resurrection methodology if it is mentioned it's very rare maybe a little bit and often it's just to score points against each other in debate but methodology is important there is a responsibility in debates on the resurrection to lay down what your methodology is and to explain to the public why you've adopted a particular methodology out of many many debates that I have seen on the resurrection of Christ debates between skeptics and Christians methodology is not a, is not dealt with as much as it should be if you're going to use a methodology such as the base theorem like Richard Carey the atheist it is beholden on you to be intellectually honest and to inform the public that your methodology is not used by most historians a methodology it should have a hermeneutical aspect it should have historical criteria what do I mean by comprehensive Adolf Schlatter of 16th of August 1852 to 19th of May 1938 wrote over 400 papers on New Testament theology and New Testament studies he ranked as one of the great theologians of modern times equal to that of Bultmann his historical method is used in my debates I have wanted to debate many atheists but I've not been able to find many who were willing to debate me on the resurrection but if they were to debate me on the resurrection part of my methodology is using Schlatter, Adolf Schlatter he, ad he advises the avoidance of sectarian bias that you study all relevant material before you come to a conclusion he seeks to understand the historical context of any ancient text it gives equal time to primary source material and secondary source having a rich interplay between primary source historical material and contemporary scholars very often you will find with the atheist that number one they do not pay careful attention to historical data 
So for example, you will find, and I've checked all the time, I have checked with Richard Carrier, an atheist, his use of quotations from um, the book of uh, the Song of Isaiah and other ancient texts. And every time, correct. So it's important to pay particular attention to the historical data that we're looking at and to quote it in context, which most of the time the skeptics fail to do. But at the same time, we must be intellectually honest and we must be willing to engage with the wider scholarly community. This again is one of the great weaknesses of the atheist community. If you read the atheist community or the skeptical community in their critique of Christianity uh, on the resurrection of Christ, you will find how very limited in their intellectual apparatus that they have. They cannot or very rarely will engage with the wider scholarly community. And so you have fringe scholars like Richard Carrier and agnostic scholars like um, what's his name, um, Dr. Price, who are so fringe and, and, and incapable of actually engaging in the more rich and wider scholarly community. Uh, Dr. Price has been associated with the Jesus Seminar. That is a very limited part of the scholarly world in historical Jesus studies. So if you're going to debate on the resurrection of Christ, if you're going to show yourself to be competent, you need to be show that you've engaged with a wider scholarly community. For example, in this paper, I've mentioned Dominic Crossan, who I've consistently studied his material. I have mentioned Dale Allison, whose material I have studied. I have mentioned a whole variety of scholars that are completely different from my view, and I've honestly read them and... So your me methodology must be comprehensive and deep. And so my model is Adel Schlatter there. Secondly, you must have a methodology in understanding ancient text. It's no good quoting ancient text unless you put down and show us what you're using as a methodology. I use the historical grammatical method. I use a method where I try to look at ancient text, whether the Bible or anything else, in its historical grammatical context. That is very clear because often skeptics will quote text and we're not aware of the hermeneutical method they are using and how they use that method in the interpretation of Keaton Hodwink by quotations from Bart Ehrman and by Richard Carrier, these kind of scholars who will quote a text but they are not giving us the methodology that they're using or, or, or and how they got to that quotation. If you want to know my methodology, go and read the books by Dr. Bob Utley, who is an expert. Uh, www.freebiblecommentary.org PDF seminar textbook by Dr. Bob Utley. So we, we, we have a methodology of depth, looking at primary source material and engaging with contemporary scholarship. We have a, a hermeneutic of historical grammatical method. We have a historical we use a methodology that most scholars will use. I hope in my lecture to use the methods that historians use in assessing a hypothesis for historical data. This means my method tries to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also it is very important to note as we use the historian's tools it means we are using historical data as evidence not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. This is important because one or two skeptics have tried to strawman me here. They've tried to suggest that my belief in the Bible is the word of God is influencing my in 
my understanding of the historical data. But I have been upfront and honest that I have presuppositions. But also the skeptic has to be honest that they have presuppositions. Discussion, even though my presupposition may be the inspired Bible, my argument does not rest on an inspired Bible, but upon historical method that secular historians use. So therefore this argument against me would be a straw man. Number one, the historical method that historians would generally use is number one, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of the facts that our hypothesis accounts. The hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope. Second, explanatory power. This looks at quality of the given facts. If you can explain your position with less ambiguity, then it has better explanatory power. If one has a strong presence, you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history. The hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than any other position. We look at opposing views and see also if they conform, confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, ha less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that lack any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems and if this is the position it strengthens one case, one's case. Page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lacona on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now, I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. The historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical f facts and come to some objective understanding, but we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time, we can look at reality of the facts. They are there, facts are facts. But there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use, and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. 
Dr. E.P. Sanders has noted has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with now what the atheists do not tell you what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-christianity they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection like Dr. Carrier Earl Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders set, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean who preached and did healings. Number three, Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followed as a movement. And finally, a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement. Galatians chapter 1, 13, 22, Philippians 3, 6. The persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career. 2 Corinthians 11, 24, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34. E.P. Sanders, 1985, Jesus and Jude Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press, and just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars, notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community, virtually no atheist on the internet, or even the atheist scholars, will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. And now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't beat, beat me in debate on this. I had a, a debate with DPR Jones, I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship my arguments and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently John McDropout challenged uh, took on the challenge for a debate and I would actually love to debate him and I've said I would debate him and given him uh, a said to him that I would debate him but when you have idiots ride into the city center and try to film your atheist when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the kind of uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture but basically the atheist community the skeptical community has not in any shape or form in any way dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence they have not dealt with presuppositions they have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form the best that they can do 
is quote Earl Doherty or a Richard Carrier or a Price but there has been no in-depth debate and discussion on the issues that I brought forward but there was a tacit running away from the skeptic and an endorsement of drama and cyberbullying against me and the scholarship that I had to bring on this subject was completely ignored when people realized that hey, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about and if we continue to discuss with him we're going to be educating people and we don't want them to be educated in the kind of scholarship that this guy is going to bring and so I was excluded from the conversation So, so we'll look at some of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, first of all, the four Gospels can be early first century and can be shown to be of eyewitness material. I could go on and on and on of the litany of information here. Uh, if you want to get a general outline, um, you can look at Wallace's paper on uh, tracing the eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, back to the first century as a very popular look at. But you can find that the four Gospels can be traced back to the early first century and traced back as eyewitness material. From a historical point of view, that's pretty amazing. You, you don't normally get that kind of quality information on a topic. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, uh, but we'll just mention 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, in his letter on the Gospels and other New Testament books. Basically, it's over 19,000 times the early church fathers quote from the Gospels. You can look at the Didache teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Prayer. That puts them, the Gospel to 95 AD. Uh, Matthew's quoted in 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the life witnesses were around. Scholars that believe that the Gospels are from an early date are John W. Wainham, Professor of New Testament Greek, Berg Gerdesen, Swedish scholar, Professor at Lund University, Marcel Jaus, a French Biblical scholar, Karsten Peter Thied, German papyriologist. You want to look at the more popular level, look at the early eyewitnesses of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. Ignatius letter to Trillian uh, in 9.4 we read Jesus Christ was of the stock of David who was from Mary he was truly born eight drank was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate was truly crucified and died who also was truly raised from the dead his father raising him what does this that, that's www.earlywritings.com Ignatius what, what does this evidence prove about the Gospels and the early church fathers here well first of all it proves that the Gospels are first century documents secondly it proves that these Gospels were authoritative and thirdly it proves that these Gospels had a general historical narrative that is consistent across the board uh, and and can be compared to other data which confirms that this is highly unlikely uh, it was an invention. If this story of the death and resurrection of Christ is consistent for a variety of documents in the second century and in the first century, it gives you a clear indication that those events took place. Secondly, the nature of the Gospels 
the the gospels text are historical historically reliable now here is an important debate that I had with some atheists such as Thunderfoot and Ozzy and all the rest of them and the kind of laughable arguments that they would use where Thunderfoot would say that comics can have historical facts in them but it doesn't mean that Spider-Man rose from the dead or whatever well first of all the Gospels are a particular genre of literature comics are a particular genre